So thank you, and uh, it's, it's a terrific opportunity for me to, to be here in this beautiful city in this exciting conference. As I was thinking about my opening remarks, I was imagining sort of half the room going, you know, what the hell is a Harvard psychiatrist doing on stage at a media conference? And then I'm thinking the other half of the audience is going, well, it's about time there's a shrink on stage because all this technology and the map, it's driving me mad, right? That's, that's the perfect opportunity. But I sometimes get asked, as, as I actually have in the last couple of days, you know, why is uh, a neuroscientist on a stage like this? And, and the simple answer for me is that if there was a force on the planet that influenced what you wear, what you ate, and how you voted, wouldn't you want to understand it? And I think for me, it's very exciting to have technologies and have a science that can help begin to understand what we like to think of as the, the why behind the what. We've heard a lot about relevance today. It's absolutely important. We've heard a lot about behavioral targeting and the ways things can uh, be, be analyzed and all the terrific data that's available to us. I'm going to try to take a scientific approach to understanding why all of these channels are beginning to affect things in, in new ways and how we can use neuroscience and the models they create without a real understanding of the brain. You don't need to understand the brain, but you do need to understand the models and some fundamentals about the brain in order to make this work. So before I do that, I'm going to uh, show a short video just to sort of introduce Interscope and, and what we do. Interscope is one of a number of companies in the evolving space called neuromarketing. And neuromarketing, quite simply, is the application of neuroscience to marketing questions. We actually just use the best tools for the job. So when we need to measure emotion, we use physiology. It's the most direct place to measure the emotion. When we want to understand attention, we use eye tracking. And when we want to understand cognition, we'll ask questions. We measure skin sweat, heart rate, respiration, and emotion from a biometric belt. And what the eye tracking does is allow us to capture visual attention. We can measure within a fraction of a centimeter exactly where the audience is looking. One of the great opportunities that Interscope has for its clients is to say, look, for years you've been relying on your eyes and your gut to evaluate your messaging and communication. What if we were able to bring you the eyes and the gut of your audience? So what if we were able to bring you the eyes and the gut of your audience? Interscope believes that unconscious emotional responses direct attention, enhance learning and memory, and ultimately drive the behaviors that you care about. That belief is based on over five decades of academic research and now five years of this, this thing called neuromarketing, which is beginning to crack the code of how unconscious processes actually influence and drive what we call engagement. I'm inspired by this quote often for, for two reasons. One, tell me and I will forget, show me and I may remember, involve me and I will understand. What I like about this is that it, it reflects sort of uh, the heuristic or the, the, the model of engagement I'm about to describe. But number two, it actually reflects a bit about how the brain works. So it turns out there's less brain resources dedicated to auditory processing than there is visual processing. And there are more brain networks dedicated to visual processing. And then involvement generally and almost by definition triggers an emotional response, which is the most brain processing that we can ever dedicate. The prefrontal cortex and its attachments to the emotion centers uses one third of the brain's uh, resources. And if you haven't seen the iceberg slide and you're like the 1% the of the world who hasn't seen this slide yet, uh, I'm gonna walk you through it. And this is uh, the sort of neuroscience rule of thumb that something like 75 to 95% of brain processing happens below conscious awareness. So the tip of the iceberg is what we're all sort of used to interacting with and dealing with. And traditional measures do a fantastic job of mapping that landscape. But there's this area under the water that until we've had scalable and accessible technologies, we really haven't had very much access to. And I'm not saying that, that we can capture the whole 75 or 95%. We're, we're capturing a big part of it. And a big part of that is what is happening on an emotional level. So from an Interscope perspective, whether we're talking about content or the advertising in that content or relaunching a, a, a brand or a new package or understanding a point of sale moment or how smartphones are being used at, at the point of sale. All of this goes through an information processing framework. So all of these are just stimuli to us. 
from, from an Interscope perspective. We're understanding this as information. And that information generally has either an auditory or a visual component to it. And so we use eye tracking, as we, we noted, to capture that. And then we use our biometrics to capture the unconscious processing. And then we talk to people to get the conscious piece. And this is where the iceberg metaphor actually came from. There are two fundamental paths in the brain that information goes through. And the key to this slide is that while only a small portion makes it to the conscious part of the brain, 100% goes through that emotional part. So as mentioned in, in the intro, uh, we take a, a, a biological approach to the brain. Information from the brain then flows through the body, triggering these kinds of responses that are captured through medical grade technology that end up on our belt and eye tracker. And the key here is that we're not interested in any one channel. We're not interested in any one person's response. This is a biological wisdom of the crowd. We're combining these across the audience. And we're really looking for what are the moments in a communication, regardless of the platform, that are truly engaging. So let's define engagement. It's one of these words that's often used, uh, but rarely defined, sometimes abused. And it's been used, I think I counted over 16 times today in different ways. Um, I'm going to encourage us to, to really rally around this particular definition, which we published in 2006, which is attention to something that emotionally impacts you. Right, so if I have a cup of water here, which I do, and I take a sip and I put it down, I have to pay attention to that, right? Make sure I don't spill it. Am I engaged with that? If I take that same cup of water, I pick it up and I fumble it on my suit, I'm going to redirect my attention, I'm going to wipe my suit off for a moment and then come back. That second one generated an emotional response. I can't believe I spilled water in front of all those people. Right? Which one do you think I'm going to remember two weeks from now? Attention is a necessary but not sufficient condition. And it doesn't have to be on a conscious level, but you've got to have some part of your brain attending to a stimulus in order to be engaged. But it's that afterburner of emotion that sears it in to the association cortex and the related memory centers that allow brands to grow. Now, when we think of engagement, we measure it using these signals. And when our signals line up, we call that synchrony. So imagine all these babies sort of looking at something dangling in front of them, right? Relevance, we've heard that term a number of times, brings people in, directs them to the content, and creates emotionally similar journeys. Confusion and boredom push people away psychologically, unconsciously. They retreat, retreat from that content, and then they respond to their own thoughts. And our engagement meter drops. I'm going to show you one example of how we use this for the advertisers to help optimize creative. And this comes from a beer ad that was uh, one of four beer ads that was used in the US for the Advertising Research Foundation uh, actually initiative on engagement. And they had over 30 research companies from around the world try to define it. And uh, we're going to click on the first view here. And I'm just going to orient you for a second. So remember those four channels we talked about? Well, this is all those four channels, two processing algorithms, synchrony plus intensity, across an audience of 30 single male beer drinkers in the Boston area, very hard recruit. We found them. Good, you are awake. And we showed it in a context. We used to use two and a half men starring Charlie Sheen. We don't do that anymore, primary reasons. But we put it in context because this is, the brain is a context machine. And studying communications outside of a context will tell you something about a communication in the one context it will never be in. So it's very important to do these things in, in some sort of clutter. We rotate it uh, for order effects. And it's roughly a 100-point scale. And that dashed line is not average engagement. It's actually where synchrony becomes dyssynchrony. Below that, we know that channel changing goes up and fast forwarding increases. We're going to talk about that in a second. We're going to play this ad and, and, and watch the ball and watch the ad, and then we'll chat about it for a second. What happens? You know, the audience of single male beer drinkers starts out neutral. They see an attractive female, a little boost in their heart rate, no surprise there. Height of the joke, so called weasel, goes in the refrigerator, puts a generic beer down, grabs a premium beer, and then what happens? He basically walks out and saunters through the audience, turns his back on the audience at one point, engagement drops, and there's a little tail up of the black screen branding moment. 
But of course, we'd be worried about channel changing and fast forwarding at that point, getting there. Number one and number two, what if you gave the beer to the girl? We know they're engaged with her. The story has an arc. The, the brand is the hero. And when people ask, you know, Dr. Marcy, what, what have you seen over and over again in advertising research? It's very simple. Compelling stories, relatable characters, the product, brand, or services integrated into that story, and the key message and the brand at the highest point of engagement. So now you would say as we go to the next slide, well, that, that spike right there, which is actually quite high, is during a branding moment, right? That's fantastic. And normally we would say absolutely. Well, here comes the eye track. If you can see this, this is called a heat map. It's the areas of fixation. People are reading the word weasel. They're looking at his face. And then there's this big hot spot over the generic beer. Nine out of 10 people said, I was trying to figure out what the generic beer was. People, people read left to right, switch the two around, get it out of its picture. Now, I'm, I'm going to uh, show one, one more version of this ad. And this is actually something that, that we created. But we've done this on a number of times. And it's, you know, again, I, I want to make it clear that, that making Great communications is hard. Uh, and, and bringing complex science to that is hard. But getting those two to interact is, is even harder. Um, but we did this on our own. But we're going we're gonna to play a 15-second version of this. And what we did is we took out the non-engaging parts. So let's play this and see how it goes. Now, most people, when, uh, when I play that after them, I ask, you know, what, what did it feel like? And most of them say, it essentially, it felt like the same ad, right? We took out the non-engaging, non-informationally relevant parts of the ad, and it was half the time. So you can imagine the impact of that on, on other folks. OK, so that's interesting. We do this for some of the largest consumer packaged goods and financial services companies in the world. And we do this every day. Uh, and we're excited about that. But we also work on the media side of things. And in fact, it was a media company, NBC Universal, that, that really launched Interscope. And NBC had a problem. Heroes, popular show on Monday night, 10 million viewers, 3 million of them were watching on a DVR. It was the largest proportion of a primetime audience that was using a DVR. Penetration at that time was around 15%. It's a very techie audience. And there was some data from, from some traditional research firms like, like Miller Brown showing next day recall for people watching on their DVR was comparable to that for people watching live. How's that possible? They're skipping the ads. So NBC hired us to say, you, know, you guys are smart. Can you figure this out? I don't know, maybe. Let's see if we can. So uh, the Boston Globe actually covered the fact that we were doing this story, study. And the way we did is we brought people to a central location. Fans of the show, don't watch at home. Come you know, watch with us. We're going to put this biometric belt on at the time it was a vest. We're going to do, do some eye tracking. And we gave you know, the group that watches on a DVR uh, a TiVo, and the group that didn't, they watched it live. And the New York Times covered the results of the first study, which was people were as engaged while they were fast forwarding through ads as they were when they were watching live. Now, I was surprised. NBC was certainly surprised. Like, what the heck is going on? So they did something that, that rarely happens. They repeated the study. Larger study, more people, more eye tracking. And it was amazing. Same result. People are staring at the screen. They're leaning forward, and they're anxious to see their show come back on. And they're getting brand impression after brand impression after brand impression. Subsequent studies that show that people actually will recall information, even if it's at six times normal speed with no audio. And we found next day recall for ads that had been seen before was more than double what you would expect. And then we recently updated this in a, in a piece of media magazine that talked about why didn't the DVR kill television. In fact, television is more relevant than ever. And it's in part because people actually don't skip ads. OK, flash forward. And then we got asked to do some multi-platform stuff. And this is the summary slide of a study that was done in Canada, 24 brands. Each brand had to be in market with television plus one other platform. And the, uh, the way we presented the data, cognition is essentially recall next day. Emotion is that, that biometric emotion stuff I've been talking about. And we sort of plotted this as a heuristic of how things work. And you can see online display is very low. This is display ads. They're not the video. Newspaper, very cool, but, but can generate recall. People are in the mental mindset of reading. Radio, very, very hot, but don't really remember those very much. And then online video actually pushes this curve out a little bit. And television's all the way out here. And we've been talking about this. We've heard references to this today. You know, television is very powerful. The question is, why? And I'm going to show you uh, quickly uh, one ad from that study. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about it in the different context it was in. So let's watch this ad, and then we'll talk about it.
Every generation gets a chance to change the world. Pity the nation that won't listen to you, boys and girls. Cause the sweetest melody is the one we have. Is Okay, you, you don't need a lot of biometrics to say that. That's a, that's a pretty engaging ad, right? What happens to that same ad online? So online now we have uh, the eye tracker, which is allowing us to define an area of interest, and we do that by you know, using the, the software and the technology to allow us to say, okay, ad here. This is how we you know, can discover banner blindness and, and talk about cures for it. Here's the same ad now online. Now these white dots, I'm gonna talk over this. Just watch the dots. Those are individual literally eyeballs, and you can see, as we watch this unfold a little bit, that the eyes are moving around. Now, the interesting thing is they actually coalesce a little bit here in a moment, actually where the emotional engagement goes up, which doesn't always correlate. But the point here is that even Bono and you too have competition online. And it got us thinking about, okay, well, what, what's going on in, in, in the brains of audiences in those two platforms and those environments? So we were asked uh, by our clients to create a model. And in order to present that model, I'm gonna to present to you the prototypical American male who watches a lot of television. And he watches that television and, and, and gets his entertainment video on a lot of different screens. And the bigger that screen is, the more immersed he or she is in that content. And what we know, or certainly what we speculated, was that, well, immersion or immersive engagement is primarily generating emotional responses. It's what neuroscientists call bottom-up processing because the emotion centers of the brain are actually deep and below the, the conscious centers of the brain. But when you compare that to that same prototypical male who also wants flexibility and interactivity, now he's actually using a different part of his brain, which is more directed attention goal-oriented, and now more top-down processing. So what this led to was, was an opportunity to say, what, what if we sort of could create this model and then test that model? And so this is what we call our brand immersion model. So on the vertical axis, we call this immersive engagement. On the horizontal axis, we call this flexible engagement. And the thing about immersive engagement is it's primary emotional. And you can actually create need states where they didn't exist, and you can reinforce need states that have gotten a little bit weaker and connections that have gotten a little weaker. One of the things we did in the study uh, that, that we're actually uh, releasing in the U.S. today and, and very excited to talk about with uh, the U.S. version of one of our sponsors, Fox Broadcasting Company, um, we took unfamiliar brands, so we took international brands and showed them to a U.S. audience, products that they've never heard of before, and we showed them in two env environments, and then we did a, a, a brand resonance exercise on the back end, and we found that you know, television was able to create links, create unconscious associations where they didn't exist. It was very hard to do that in the flexible environment of the web. Now, of course, there's a continuum here, right? You know, I like to talk about the difference between an iPhone and an Android. We were having this conversation last night, right? The iPhone limits flexibility, but it creates a slightly more emotional and a, a engaging experience, right? And, and so different strokes for different folks. So the real question is, and I'll end with this, is how do we optimize on these platforms? Well, in the one sense, we have to make sure that we're doing the majority of our emotional communication and our brand linkage and associations in that powerful television environment. And then we're using our flexible environment to fulfill need states. So we create need states with high emotion. We can fulfill them with flexibility. And then we can still optimize on each of those. I'll give you a couple quick examples. Uh, uh, on the internet, uh, we, uh, we were out recently with uh, some work we did with CNN.com using Facebook as a vehicle for sharing news content, which is becoming this real social currency. And what we found is if we, had, we brought in friendship pairs. And so, okay, we have the influencer and the influencee, you know, recommend some content. We compared that to content that was viewed that wasn't recommended by a control group. And we found that recommendees, people who are on their Facebook page, oh, my friend just sent this to me, were five times more engaged with the content and three and a half times more engaged with the advertising that went with that. And again, it's that, that, that social aspect of it, that 
supercharge that, that advertising. We were also did some work with Yahoo, I know another sponsor here back in the US, where you know, looking at the kinds of things you've been talking about, but measuring it, which is relevance of the ads and products, plus the synergy of the context and content, auto ad and auto environment, particularly if that person's in the market for an automobile, leads, not surprisingly, to higher engagement. And then what Fox did is said, okay, that's all great, but what if you combine them? So you remember that chart where we had the, the different platforms um, and we saw that big gap between display advertising and, and television? Well, you know, th that doesn't go away. But what was interesting in the study that we just released is that when you combine this low red dot with the experience of television, which is that orange dot, you get the green dot. And then when you take the program context, things like for Fox in the US, Glee or American Idol, and you bring people to websites that also have that tie-in, you get another boost up. And the size of that circle is the impact on the brand on an unconscious level. So the idea here is how can we use uh, the, the new brain sciences to help optimize our communications, to help explain the why behind the what, and to grow our knowledge. And the hope here is to, to really use these tools uh, to deepen insights that go beyond uh, traditional research and, and complement it. I'm also very excited to announce our, our global par partnership with uh, Ipsos uh, worldwide to create tools that really bring, bring the best of both worlds to the marketplace. So, to get to the kind of diagnostic insights, I, I love that last panel because it really got to, yeah, but, but what about the content? What about the creative? How are we going to keep doing it? It's very relevant. It continues to be relevant and will always be relevant. Creating new models are important, and using these models to rationally do test and compare hypotheses in market, and then iterate on those results. And then ultimately the goal, of course, is improved ROI. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Gerhard, and hopefully that was helpful.